Robert Owen, and I love to explore nature. Some of my best friends are animals. <laughs> I'm Isabel Yamazaki. I love technology and inventions. Yep, yeah, I'm a geek. Hi, Giles. Hi, I'm Giles. Artificial intelligence at your service. Together, we're exploring how amazing discoveries in nature are helping us design brilliant new human inventions. New technology that will make our world a better, greener and more amazing place to live. <laughs> Today we find out which animal can help jet pilots better cope with massive G-forces. <laughs> and what animal can help us prevent bushfires. Oh, wow! The answers will amaze you because, because they're, they're wild, wild but, but true. true. G-forces I just experienced are nothing compared to what a jet pilot feels in the sky. Hi, Giles. Hi, Isabel. Yes, G-force can make the pilot black out. It's called a G-lock, or G-force-induced loss of consciousness. Watch what happens when the G-force is too high. As it increases, the pilot develops tunnel vision and blacks out. <sighs> Is there some way we could stop that from happening with some kind of cool technology? Well, there is something that can help pilots with G-forces. Your mission, to find the animal that can help. But I'll give you kids a clue. It has to do with maintaining your blood pressure so that massive G-forces do not stop blood getting to your brain. The animal you're looking for has found a way to deal with this. OK, I'll let Robert know. Bye. Hey, Robert. Hi, Isabel. We need to find an animal that could help pilots out with G-Force. Hmm, any clues? Just this. OK, I'll see what I can find. I'm pretty sure G-Forces have to do with changing blood pressure. If we look at animals that are very acrobatic and move up and down and side to side really quickly, that's how we're going to find our answer. Swooping birds must have to deal with a lot of G-forces because they duck and weave in all different directions really quickly. But birds seem too obvious an answer. Giles wouldn't make it that easy. What about frogs? They must experience a massive G-force when they take off. Or monkeys, when they leap and then stop abruptly when landing. Or here's an idea. Oh, wow, that's so cool. These guys must have serious issues with blood pressure. Think about it. An average adult giraffe can stand around five metres tall. That's a long way for blood to travel against gravity. And when they bend down to take a drink, imagine all that blood suddenly rushing down towards its head. It must have some neat way of controlling its blood pressure. Hello, Robert. I've just looked at a giraffe, and I think this is the animal that I'm looking for. Whenever it bends down, all of the blood rushes to its head. And when it stands up, all of the blood rushes back down to its body. And it doesn't faint. Good point. Giraffes do cope with changing blood pressure well. I'm going back to the lab right now to tell Isabel. See ya. I've got to work out what G-force has to do with gravity. Want some help? Yeah. Gravity is the force between two objects, like this pen, and the Earth. I was looking for that. G-force simulates the force we feel from gravity, but in different directions. G-force is caused by intense changes of speed and direction, like you on the roller coaster, or the pilots in their fighter jets. Right now, you are experiencing 1G. In space, the G-force is close to zero. That's 2.9G. 
and a slap on the back is 4G, but you don't feel them because they're too quick. The roller coaster, on the other hand, was 5G. I sort of get it. Okay, mass, gravity, and what's this? Centripetal force. Centripetal force is a force that causes a body to follow a curved path. Whoa, there are all sorts of things involved with G-forces. Perhaps I can lend a hand, Isabel. Centripetal force is important because it can pull any direction different to the direction of gravity. For example, horizontally through your arms if you're on a fast spinning merry-go-round. Hey, Isabel. Oh, hey, Robert. I think I found the animal with all of the answers, the giraffe. What does a giraffe have to do with G-force and centripetal force? Centri... <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> centripetal force. Oh. Remember when you used to go on a merry-go-round and you had to hold on so that you didn't fall off? That was because of centripetal force. I have an idea for an experiment. We have to head outside, though. OK. OK, so do you think that this water would stay in this cup if you turned it upside down? Here you go. All right, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, was this actually the experiment? No, that was gravity. Okay. Now I'm just going to fill this back up again mm -hmm. and place it on this sling. Okay. You swing it around. Now let's see if the water stays in the cups. For you guys at home, don't try this with anything other than plastic or paper cups. The water didn't come out of the cups. Yeah, and that was centripetal force. Cool. Yeah. But I still don't understand what giraffes have to do with centripetal force and g-force. Well, I'm pretty sure that g-force is all about blood pressure. And since giraffes are so big and tall, they would definitely have to deal with changing blood pressure. This is Jerry the giraffe. I love him. Now, I've actually constructed him to demonstrate how much energy it actually takes for the blood to pump all the way up to his head. Ah. I've used this drill and this water pump to actually represent the giraffe's heart. OK. Shall we give it a try? OK. All right, here we go. Now, you can definitely see, as it got higher and higher and higher up to his head, it got a lot slower. What happens to the giraffe when it bends down to drink, then? Hmm. Do you want to check it out? OK. <laughs> Ready, Isabel? Yep. OK, here we go. Wow! Look, it's expanding. Yeah, its head's really expanding. <laughs> this definitely didn't happen to the giraffes that I saw. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> that didn't happen either. The real giraffes must be able to control their blood pressure really, really well. Hey, Giles. I let you stick your neck out on this one because we've been able to copy one way that giraffe controls blood pressure. The very first G-suits, invented by Wilbur Franks in 1941, were basically very tight trousers that prevented too much blood being pushed into the pilot's legs, away from the brain. The skin on the giraffe's legs is exceptionally tight, helping to push the blood back up. And this is pretty much how G-suits worked for many decades. I knew it was the giraffe. Not so fast. Unless humans can copy the giraffe's incredibly complex system of one-way valves to control blood flow, then it's back out to the wilderness for you. There is another animal that's been able to provide a better solution. It's still about constricting blood flow, but this creature has something else that we can copy. One more clue. Think of something that changes direction very suddenly and what you don't fall into the pond. I'm pretty sure I have a good idea of what it is. I'm going to go check it out and I'll see you back at the lab. OK. I'm looking for a really special animal. One that can accelerate faster than an aerobatic plane. Aha. Look at how fast it moves. A quarter of its body weight is in its wing muscles. It's so fast you can hardly follow it. It must have a really good trick for dealing with G-forces. You're right, Robert. Dragonflies are amazing. They can experience up to 30 Gs, and even highly trained pilots will pass out at 10 Gs. So how do they cope with such massive G-forces? 
Can I be of assistance? A dragonfly stabilizes its organs in circulation with internal liquid cushions. Inside the dragonfly, fluid shifts and responds to G-forces and thus gets to cushion the dragonfly's heart and blood flow so it keeps functioning normally. So does that mean that a pilot needs to be submerged in water in the cockpit? <laughs> that doesn't sound very practical. No, that wouldn't be practical. And a little messy on a roll. The secret is getting the fluid into the suit. Have a look at this. It's a G-suit designed by a Swiss pilot called Andreas Reinhardt. And guess what the suit is called? Libel, German for dragonfly. It clings like a second skin. And once in the air, liquid columns shift within the suit, reacting to the G-forces, getting into just the right spot to compress the pilot's body, making sure the proper blood pressure is maintained to the brain. That is amazing. I think it makes sense. Let's do one more experiment, OK? OK, Robert, so I've got here a water balloon, mm -hmm. and I'm going to get you to swing it around, and we're going to see what happens. All right? It actually really did change its shape a lot as I was spinning it. That was the effects of G-force in motion. So if this was actually a pilot in like a stunt plane or something, then it would certainly not be good for him being shaken around like that. <laughs> so then what do you think would happen if we put that water balloon inside a bottle of water? We'll see what happens. OK, here we go. OK. <laughs> well, the water balloon didn't distort or change shape whatsoever. Yeah, and that's because the water inside this bottle is actually cushioning and supporting the water balloon as it experiences G-force. I suppose that it's actually really similar to when a dragonfly is flying around. When they're whizzing and flying all over the place, their organs stay in the right spot. Exactly. Excellent work, you two. Look at this example of the technology in use today. On the left is the pilot in the Labelle G MultiPlus suit, and at the right is the state-of-the-art pneumatic G-force system. The pilot on the left is speaking and able to move his arms about. The pilot on the right is having a bit more of a hard time. Now that pilots can cope with greater G-forces, they'll be able to fly faster and do even wilder moves. Hey, Robert, look at this. Cars can even benefit from the G-force. Whoa, that is so, so cool. It's riding on a wall. Let's try it. I prefer to stay on a horizontal surface, sorry. Let's go. What? Robert? We're on our way to do a back burn. I'm really excited. We're going to light a small fire and burn off all this dry fuel so that later huge wildfires can't get through here. Oh. Hey, Giles. So, you're fighting fire with fire. Getting rid of all this built up fire fuel in winter so it doesn't all burn in a huge wildfire in summer. Yeah, this is a controlled backburn to get rid of the dry stuff safely. Wildfires are a huge problem. All the forests around the world have massive amounts of carbon. And when the forests burn, that carbon escapes into the atmosphere. Every year, wildfires kill hundreds of people across the world and millions of forest creatures die. So it's really important that we stop them from happening. And for all you guys watching, please remember never to go near a forest fire without a fire expert on hand. Hmm. I wonder if there's a better way to find them to spot places with dry fuel so that they know where to backburn and can prevent heaps of wildfires. I reckon you're getting warm, Isabel. Ha! Huh. In fact, new technology is being developed that can better spot places likely to burn. Some clever people are developing remarkable new technologies based on the amazing abilities of a particular animal. Here's a clue. Any ideas? Not really. I'll call Robert right now. Bye. Hey, Robert. We've got to find an animal that can help us find places with heaps of dry fire fuel easily. Well, did Giles give you any clues? Just this. Hmm. All right, I'll see what I can come up with. 
So what animal could help us prevent bushfires? I think it has something to do with detecting all of the built-up fuel on the forest floor. But how would an animal do that? It kind of looks like some kind of multiple lens camera. So maybe it has to do with an animal that has really, really good eyesight. Right now, I'm looking at a dragonfly. Now, these guys are so, so cool because they have 30,000 lenses in their eyes. But they can only see really, really well from a short distance. So this certainly can't be the animal that we're looking for. What about chameleons? Their eyes can swivel all around. One eye can look one way, while the other looks somewhere else. But how would that help see the leaf letter from above? Maybe it's something that flies high up, so it can see the forest from above. Oh, look, it's an eagle. These guys have amazing eyesight. They actually have binocular vision which means that their eyes have overlapping fields of view, giving them great perception of depth. You are on the right track, Robert. Birds of prey do have amazing eyesight and can spot food from a great distance. And there is one in particular that has an amazing skill. Let me think. A bird of prey with the best eyesight. I know. I've seen these guys do really amazing things. The kookaburra can spot something from really, really far away. It can spot any small insects moving around on the forest floor. I think I found the perfect animal. Cool. What is it? All right, let me give you a hint. Kookaburra. Now, they can actually see things from really, really far away. How could kookaburra's eyesight prevent bushfires? They can actually see through all of those bushes and trees onto the forest floor and pick out certain things. Maybe by having special eyesight, you'd be able to see if a forest is full of fire fuel. If I understand you correctly, you're saying that the secret is to have great long-distance vision. Why don't you test it? Behind you both are some gumballs. Place the gumballs inside the tray and put it on the floor. So, Isabel, you're going to time Robert as he counts the total number of blue gumballs. Ready, go. Okay, that was 13 seconds. I counted 16. Actually, Robert, there are 19. So, 13 seconds and not quite the right number of gumballs. So, let's now test your theory of long distance vision. Isabel, remove some balls to change it up a bit. Robert, using the binoculars, count the total number of blue balls. Ready, go. Fifteen gumballs. There are actually sixteen gumballs because I took three away. Oh, this time it took him 18 seconds. Oh, wow, that's a lot longer. Did the binoculars make it easier or harder? Well, it actually kind of made it harder. Okay, let me help you along. Kookaburras have great long-distance vision, but they also have another trick. Let's perform the experiment again, but this time use color subtraction glasses. In this case, let's use blue again. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow! But it's all blue. Yeah, everything's blue, but some things are, like, really, really white. Look at the gumballs. <gasps> oh, oh wow, God. the blue ones stand out. OK, let's do the experiment again. OK, I counted 17 gumballs. And that was in six seconds. Wow, that's so much quicker. And you're also right, because I took two gumballs away. Perfect, you two. What you've just discovered is the power of color subtraction technology. Let's head back to the forest. Imagine if you had special eyesight that can make some things that look very similar to other things stand out from the crowd. Well, that is what the kookaburra can do. But how do they do that? The kookaburra has different colored eye droplets on its retinas that function much like the color subtraction glasses you tried. Wow. So when it's searching for insects, 
it can detect tiny differences in color much better than human eyes. So what appears to us to be simply a lot of leaves and undergrowth appears to the kookaburra as something entirely different. Its special eyes pick out what it most wants to see, even from way up in a tree. Based on similar concepts to the kookaburra's eyes, amazing new technology is being developed that can discern subtle differences between one area of forest and another. Mounted on a helicopter, the system quickly scans vast areas of trees and vegetation using different filters and powerful computer processing to spot which areas are most fire prone. So, can you guess what this clever camera is looking for? Since our challenge is to find out how we could prevent bushfires more, uh, this technology would obviously have something to do with picking out the things that would help make a fire start, so the fire fuel. Exactly right, Isabel. Living leaves are full of moisture and chlorophyll, a plant's special compound that turns sunlight into energy. It's what makes them green. When leaves die, they lose their water content and chlorophyll and of course become dry and flammable. So maybe it would have a filter in its lenses that can wash out any of the other colours and just make the fire fuel stand out. Yeah, so I can really see through all the other bushland and look at the kind of drier vegetation that could catch fire. That's exactly right. This new technology can search large areas of forest and quickly identify the chlorophyll and water content of millions of leaves, and so identify dry areas most likely to burn. It's like a mix between the two experiments that we did with both the telescope and the glasses. It's like putting them together. So it is really similar to the kookaburra. And the most amazing thing is that all the concepts it's based on are wild but true.